Let's begin with a word of prayer, and then we'll get into the video this morning. If you want. Well, God, and, uh, I did send out uh, this morning a handout. Like, if we have it here, but we've got a handout also. We'll talk about that before we get started. Lord Jesus, Lord Jesus, thank you. Thank you for time together. Thank you for the ability to meet somewhere. Thank you for the miracle of technology that we can meet remotely as well. Lord, bless us today. Open our hearts and our minds to what you have to teach us. And Lord, grant us your grace and peace, wisdom and discernment, and a heart toward those who don't know you, that they might learn the truth. In Jesus' name, amen. I was, I was, I was praying yesterday while I was working on these scriptures. I, I made a list of all the scriptures that I've listed in the two videos you're going to watch today. And, you know, why are we doing this? Why, why, why have I really gone after this? And I remember a scripture that, uh, and I remember hearing it a long time ago, uh, in Acts 16, verse 16 to 18. I'm going to read it. This is from Young's literal translation, okay? And you're going to notice the difference in here from what you've heard before. And it came to pass in our going on to prayer, a certain maid having a spirit of python did meet us. Who brought much employment to her masters by its student saying, She having called Paul Hunts, was crying, saying, These men are the servants of the Most High God who declare to us a way of salvation. And she was doing, she was doing for many days, she was doing for many days, but Paul, having, having been grieved and having turned, said to the Spirit, I command thee, in the name of Jesus Christ, come forth from her. And it came forth the same hour. And what I, my point is, in the middle of this, you look at the translations in the Young Literal, the New American Standard, and the New Revised Standard degree. It's not, in most translations, we'll say the way of salvation, but the real literal translation is a way of salvation, meaning there's more than one way to God. And when we look at what we're seeing here in, these, in, the, in this film, Christ crucified, there's only one way to Jesus, and that's Christ crucified. I mean, there's no um, second chance when you're dead. There's no, I mean, the gospel is the gospel is the gospel. There's only one way. There's only one mediator, Christ Jesus. There's only one way to heaven, and that's through him. He's the door. My guardian the last few days has been talking about salvation. It's been fascinating, and he's been expressing uh, yesterday was about Jesus being the door, and he went into the point. He went into a whole dissertation on what they're talking about as far as the door. You're a sheep. <coughs> Back in the day, sheep would be led into the door, and there's only one way into the pen for when they were kept at night. Um, what would happen is during the night, thieves and robbers would come over at the top. And steal the sheep. And the sheep would not listen to anyone else's voice, so they literally have to sometimes kill the sheep in the pen and throw them over the top to steal them. The meaning, and that is a whole new meaning when you think about my sheep hear my voice. So, yeah, I just wanted to point that out. It's, it's this is what we're doing is really important. And we just went over the scripture at the bottom of the list, pointing out that. Um, Spirit of Python, again, satanic. The, the girl was declaring a way of salvation, and there's only one way of salvation. So, with that, uh, any questions or thoughts anyone has? I'm babbling here. <laughs> oh, just it speaks to the subtlety of saying for her, oh, see, these are the servants of the Most High God. And then slip in the a way to salvation, which I've never seen this translation, but yeah. 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 And that's, and I heard this. And I heard someone preach on it years ago, and uh, it came back to me, and that's why I looked it up. Bible Gateway is an awesome thing. I don't know if you all use it at all, but to look up where you find the scripture, to look up translation on a computer, it's a blessing. Now, which translation is this? Get the literal? This is Young's literal translation. Oh, yeah, I was right here. Okay. Also, if you look at the New American Standard, which is the as well, and New Revised Standard, which I grew up on. Um, that's the same thing. So with that, I'm going to move forward and we'll, we'll be here.
How are you going to stand before a holy, righteous, and just judge? Every one of us has broken his laws. And the reality is, because he's just, the debt must be paid for our sins. They believe in a place called hell, which is not scriptural. We constantly have people coming up to say, you know what, we love to see that you're out here, but we think you're doing it all wrong. You need to just be preaching love to everybody. Well, hell is a lie, a place that doesn't exist. That's the difference between what I preach and believe and what they preach. There is a popular movement underfoot to diminish the gravity of hell. You know, the idea that God is wrathful against sin and that he literally, really punishes evildoers. One megachurch pastor has ignited a theological firestorm by suggesting that our response to the Christian message in this life will not necessarily determine our eternal destiny. At the time, Rob Bell, uh, who was a megachurch pastor at a church in, in Michigan, had come out with a book called Love Wins, and it was uh, posing the question, what if our accepted views on hell, um, what if there are alternate ways of looking at, at what hell might be like, or what the afterlife even might look like. So when the book came out, uh, I think he had posted a video, a preview. Will only a few select people make it to heaven? And will billions and billions of people burn forever in hell? Yeah, before I was a Christian, I would have considered myself spiritual, uh, but not religious. I really saw God as two different people in the Bible. And it was sort of like Old Testament God's the angry God and New Testament God is the nice God. And there were a lot of things in the Bible that I just felt were wrong. As I read my Bible, I struggled with the doctrine of hell, that God, who is loving, could send sinners to hell to suffer for eternity. I wanted this God who would never send someone to hell. I wouldn't do it. So why would he? Had friends who were of other faiths and had knew really good people who died. And my theology said that if you died without accepting Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, you would burn in hell forever, like eternally. And millions of people were taught that the primary message, the center of the gospel of Jesus is that God is going to send you to hell unless you believe in Jesus. And I was like, no. I couldn't stomach that. You're amending the gospel, the Christian message, so that it's palatable to contemporary people who find, for example, the idea of hell and heaven very difficult to stomach. So here comes Rob Bell. He's made a Christian <laughs> gospel for you, and it's perfectly palatable. It's much easier to swallow. That's what you've done, haven't you? I was really into this sort of mysticism. So then if there were people, and maybe were offering a softer God, a God that said, you know, it's not just one way. It's not just Jesus. It's one of the mistakes that human beings make is believing that there is only one way. Because all those roads are going to lead to heaven. That's what I thought. This creates a basis for what I'd call a natural religion and a universal religion. Richard Rohr is a Franciscan priest who has a center for action and contemplation in Albuquerque. He's one of the most influential spiritual teachers of our time. Richard Rohr is profoundly influential among millennials and in the progressive Christian church. In fact, in an article that came out recently, he said that one of his publishers told him that his biggest demographic is younger Christians. And these aren't necessarily Catholics, but these are post-evangelicals, kids that grew up in the evangelical church. So he's influenced some major people such as Rob Bell. I can't begin to tell you what it's like to be here. I have been a Richard Rohr fan for so long. He's had a big influence on progressive Christianity with his ideas of universalism. His latest book is The Universal Christ. And then, like, you know, I became a universalist. That everybody got saved whether or not they accepted Jesus Christ as their personal Lord and Savior. Now, see, that's no competitive religion. That, no. That's an inclusive, all-inclusive all religion. All-inclusive religion. That's not the Jesus most people know. 
Certainly it's true that there have been people in the history of the church who have taught universalism, that is the doctrine that all people uh, finally will be saved, that nobody will uh, ultimately end up in eternal condemnation. That's why what you call universalism is much more of a common Christian opinion in the first three, four centuries, you know? Mm. And then it became marginalized. Now it's called but it is certainly not the case that it's uh, the dominant view in uh, any uh, epoch of the church until right now, until the modern period. It is an unavoidable conclusion from reading scripture that Jesus Christ is the only way that one can be saved, that one can be made right with God. And that's why that's been the consistent teaching of the church for over 2,000 years. John 3.18 says, Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe is condemned already, because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. You wrote, quote, Muslims do not simply have a deficient theology. They do not know God because they have rejected Jesus Christ, his Son, and they stand condemned. And it's that state of condemnation, being under the wrath of God, that the unbelieving world hates to hear about. Do you believe that that statement is Islamophobic? Absolutely not, Senator. I'm a Christian. Well, Christianity is simultaneously inclusive and exclusive. I mean, it's inclusive in the sense that we see here in the throne room in heaven, people from every tribe and language and tongue coming to Christ, embracing Christ. And we see it's inclusive in the sense that it doesn't require works. I am simply saved by faith in Christ. It's not about performing. It's not just good people. It's just anyone who receives Jesus Christ. But it's exclusive in that it's just Jesus. It's just Jesus. But that's Christianity. The modern sort of secular view of religious pluralism, that, that, that is the ultimate blasphemy, that you can't say that because there are other people that believe differently. Do you believe that people in the Muslim religion stand condemned? Is that your view? Again, Senator, I'm a Christian. We see a perfect example of this actually in Bernie Sanders was interviewing a nominee for a political office and essentially put him through a religious test for that office. Do you think that's respectful of other religions? Senator, I wrote a post based on being a Christian and attending a Christian school that has a statement of faith that speaks clearly with regard to the centrality of Jesus Christ in salvation. And Bernie said that because there are Muslims who don't believe this, and based on Christian teaching, are condemned by God under the wrath of God without Christ, he equated that with this nominee believing something inherently immoral. I would simply say, Mr. Chairman, that this nominee um, is really not someone who is what this country is supposed to be about. I will vote no. As if this traditional Christian belief was so wrong that it would be, he'd be unable to fulfill the duties required of him in office. And that's not something I thought I'd see in my lifetime. As far as the exclusivity of Christianity, I have no idea because I have seen so much beauty and truth in so many other places. You know, if people want to call me liberal, I, I guess that's okay. It's only from their perspective. If they really knew the perennial tradition. Richard Rohr also says he's a perennialist. And perennialism is the belief that there is one divine reality that unites all religions. Externally, they appear different and they, pra they are practiced differently and they may have different doctrines, but those are all only external factors. There's actually a core divine truth that unites all of them. One word for it is Christ. One word for it is Christ. This, of course, erases the distinction of Christianity from any other religion and makes it just one of many. And there are such stark differences between what certain religions teach about some very big things. And the cross is what overshadows all the other religions. And as scripture says, that is the stumbling block for many. If we're worried about being right, then no, they can't all be right. But I'm not sure that that's necessarily the question that we're supposed to be asking. That's not an important question to me anyway right now. I know that this is where I am. I find myself in the Christian tradition. I'm into Jesus. 
and I think Christ is even bigger than Jesus. Well, how could anything be bigger than Jesus, at least for a Christian? Well, there is, and that's Christ. Richard Rohr makes a distinction between the historical Jesus and what he calls the cosmic or universal Christ. And you say there are two different realities. Jesus is the historical figure, Christ is the cosmic figure, which we've been talking about it. He divides Jesus and Christ because he thinks Christ is bigger than Jesus. I know people may start to tense up when they hear someone trying to redefine Jesus for them, you know. One of Richard Rohr's favorite things to say is, Christ is not Jesus' last name. Christ is not Jesus' last name, all right? Jesus became the Christ. Christ is not Jesus' last name. And that's a surprise to most Christians. I think that's a straw man because really, I don't know any Christian who thinks Christ is Jesus' last name. I think most Christians who know anything about the Bible know that Christ is the Greek for the Jewish word Messiah which means the anointed one. So of course Jesus is Christ because Jesus is the Messiah. But what Richard War says is that the first incarnation of Christ is creation. The Big Bang is the birth of the Christ, 14.5 billion years ago. And this... I have a uh, background in the New Age. I was in there very many years I was involved in Eastern belief systems, first Hinduism and then Tibetan Buddhism for a while. I was very interested in astrology and eventually became a professional astrologer until I encountered the true Christ and became a Christian at that point. I have been very alarmed to see that in progressive Christianity uh, there are influences from the New Age. Panentheism is one of them, which is one of Richard Rohr's key teachings. We're not pantheists. Authentic Christianity is panentheism. Theism, and what I would call Christian theism, is God as creator, who created the universe out of nothing and is distinct from his creation. He's omnipresent because God can't be contained in any one location. But he remains distinct from his creation, whereas pantheism is like the opposite of that. Pantheism is God and creation are one and the same. So the leaves are God, the rocks are God, and it just becomes identical with creation. Panentheism is God is in creation, and creation is in God, but God also transcends creation. There's one God who created all things. Yes. Then everything has to carry the divine DNA. And so, in Rohr's view, you look at someone else and you see Christ. That makes every single one of us have this inherent divinity, this, this shared God-like nature. So what Rohr is saying is that Christ is another name for everything. Don't think of it, first of all, as a religious concept. Think of it as a descriptor for everything, everything at least that we can see. Uh, Rob Bell has a very similar view. Rob Bell says everything is spiritual. Welcome to everything is spiritual. He even did a seminar or a series of workshops with Deepak Chopra, who's probably one of the foremost and richest New Agers around, advertising their courses, learning how you're an expression of the divine. Whereas the Bible teaches that we are hopelessly lost until Christ saves us, not containing this, this part of God already inside of us, this divine nature. I, I think of Genesis 3-5 when the serpent says to Eve, you shall be like God. And so when that bleeds over into the gospel, it doesn't just distort the gospel, it obliterates the gospel. Because of Rohr's view on panentheism, and that creation is the first incarnation of Christ. Everybody and everything is in Christ. He is the flesh and blood embodiment of something far larger and more uh, cosmic. And Rob Bell has talked about Christ as being cosmic and being a, 
an energy, a divine energy in the universe that people stumble over. People may be stumbling upon this mystery hidden in every inch of creation all the time and not knowing or having a name for it. His influence is just profound. Recently, Jen Hatmaker had Richard Rohr on her podcast, and she referred to him as a spiritual father. I, along with just thousands and thousands of my listeners, um, have learned from you for so many years. We consider you a spiritual father. He's also influenced, I know, Brian McLaren, and he's influenced the Nazarene Church. He was a speaker at the 2017 Young Clergy Conference of the Nazarene Church. He's been a guest on the Liturgist podcast, on the Deconstructionist podcast, and has influenced them. For us to say that, that Christ doesn't continue to work or manifest in ways um, outside of our Christian community um, is not a position or an assumption I'm ready to make. So there's no need for anybody to have any kind of faith in Jesus because we're already in Christ. When people say, like, Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, or Jesus is the, you know, enter through the narrow gate, they are assuming their own interpretation of what those statements are actually referring to. It says, Jesus said to him, to Thomas, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. Now this would be problematic for Richard Rohr normally, except that he says that Jesus is talking as the universal Christ here. And the reason we have so misused and misinterpreted John's Gospel is this is the eternal archetypal Christ talking. He can say, I am the way, the truth, and the life. But he's not talking about Jesus. He's talking about this mystery, this amalgam of matter and spirit, which is the way for everybody. His view of Jesus as savior is non-existent. Jesus is not a savior because we don't need salvation. We don't need to be reconciled. Uh, another word that Interestingly, this gets redefined not just in progressive Christianity, but also in the New Age movement, and that's the word atonement. Richard Rohr has said atonement is really at one and that it really means we're at one with God. We called it at one <laughs> Instead of atonement, there was no bill to be paid, there was simply a union to be named, an at one month, if you want to play with that word. Again, Richard Rohr, other progressives and New Agers, and even some conservative theologians will use the English etymology of the word atonement, which is at one meant. So that's where we get the English word atonement. And they will build their theology of atonement based on the English word. Whereas the Hebrew word, uh, which is kafar, really means to cover or to propitiate. And so the English word has more of a connotation of unity and, and reconciliation, and certainly that, that idea of reconciliation is present in the biblical idea of atonement. But to cover and to propitiate, it has to do with the penal substitution of Jesus, him taking the wrath of God upon himself and making that atonement for those who would put their trust in him. So our atonement theory, the Franciscan minority position, is basically saying no atonement is necessary. <laughs> I'm way more prone to believe in a God that redeems everybody, and a God that actually wins in the end, not by destroying his enemies, but by redeeming them, and by fixing them, by healing them. I don't know how God's going to work that out. And I do know there's, there's a lot of evidence to the contrary. But I've got to believe that what it means to be God is to be victorious and to win. I think we can all agree God wins, but trying to say that God winning means everyone will be saved in the end because judgment is God somehow losing, it just completely is refuted by Scripture. Constantly when God judges in the Scripture, this is seen as God's victory over the people he's judging. And so in Christ we see one of two victories is going to happen. The victory of me sharing in his victory and I get saved and I get redeemed or I rebel against it and the victory God has finally over us all in the end with judgment. If God is victorious, then God is victorious. <laughs>
God doesn't lose. That's what it means to be God. <laughs> so God's not losing when he judges. That's part of his winning. The greatest proponent probably in the ancient church of universal salvation is Origen. And he was deeply influenced by Middle Platonism and came to uh, articulate uh, a doctrine, as far as we can tell, of, of universal salvation. And Origen was, of course, condemned in the sixth century. Universalism was condemned in the church. Scripture does not give us an escape hatch that would allow us to believe that. Anyone who's a universalist is not a Bible believer. Uh, scripture is just too clear on that subject. There will be people who perish. There will be many people, Jesus said, who perish. That was a big moment for me. I was like, oh, so like Bart, you won't worship any God. Like you have standards for your God. And actually, my friends who don't believe in God, when we talk about the God that they don't believe in, I don't believe in that God either. And when Russell wanted to go to church, that's what made me angry. I don't want to let go of all that I've created. You know, this sort of Zen, Buddha, Jesus, I don't know what religion. Like, I really don't understand when people like to pay all the price to believe in stuff that they know. Like, it's a total leap of faith. They're just struck, like, ah, oh, I'm gonna do it. And, 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 then they, and, then, and then they leap to a God who doesn't even save Mahatma Gandhi. Gandhi's in hell, he is, and someone knows this for sure and, and felt the need to let the rest of us know. Like, why would you want to worship a God if you could imagine a better God? That's what I don't understand. Like, if you could imagine a God that's better than the one that you worship, trade up. It was really just about me taking God and making him like myself. And I had no idea what holiness meant. It comes back to idolatry. Idolatry was the sin of Israel. If you read the Old Testament, they continually went back to idolatry. You say, what a dumb nation. We're exactly the same. We don't bow to a God made with our hands. We bow to a God made with our mind. You know, I hang around with a lot of Christian people and they're like, who are you to tell God who to be? And I'm like, I'm not telling God who to be. I'm just telling you who I'll worship and who I won't. Like, you, you don't want to burn, do you? Right. Which, like, if that's the best message you have, Right. That's just a crap message. If hell didn't exist, neither would this ministry. Seriously, I would be out surfing. I'd have long hair, probably moved up to somewhere in Australia, dangling my feet as shark bait, just living for myself. But I can't. If we love God, we would obey Him. If we love people, we would warn them. How much do you have to hate somebody to not proselytize? How much do you have to hate somebody to believe that everlasting life is possible and not tell them that? Scripture doesn't leave us any room whatsoever to be universalists or annihilationists. And if you're bad, what happens? If there's no hell, you do you just get annihilated? Is that pretty much? Yeah. And that's what the Baptists have against the Seventh day Adventists. Yeah. Jesus told that story about the rich man and Lazarus. So here's a man who died in unbelief and in the afterlife he is being punished. He's conscious. He can talk. He wants to send someone back to warn his brothers not to come to this place. That's how Jesus pictured the afterlife and you can't believe what Jesus said and then turn around and say, yeah, but I believe that uh, the wicked dead will perish. If they're bad, they, they just get annihilated so they don't ever have to suffer again. Right. Yeah. It is emotionally, existentially difficult to, to wrap your head and, and heart around the idea of eternal conscious punishment. If there is any other way to get around a fiery eternal pit, why would we not be open to that idea? It's not something I don't think I would wish on my worst enemy. It's really hard to think about. I don't know any Christian who loves the idea of the people we know and love in this life who don't put their trust in Jesus experiencing some kind of eternal conscious torment. I don't think anybody thinks that's great. You know, if I were God, I, I, you would, I don't know if I'd do it that way, but I'm not God. God's wisdom is so much higher than ours. His justice is perfect. Our justice is radically broken.
So we have the Pope saying atheists can go to heaven and this mullah saying you can go to hell for using Twitter. We really need someone to clear this up. Unfortunately, we were able to contact someone who is an authority on this sort of thing and he made this tape for us. So one time I saw this video on Jimmy Kimmel where a guy was dressed up as Satan and started to talk about what hell was like and why people would go to hell. Additionally, you will not suffer the bitter flames of eternal damnation for stuff like swearing, telling little white lies, having inappropriate fantasies, homosexuality, or consensual sex of any kind between adults. And he's probably expressing a lot of the same views that most Americans would express. You honestly think God is going to hand out the same punishment for mass murder that he does for sexting? He's saying basically that you know, the only way you're going to go to hell is if you kill someone. If you meet me in the afterlife and you're confused as to why, it's because of the guy you killed. The thing that he's doing in that show is he's actually taking the place of God. This is why people go to hell. Boom, 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 boom. Based on what? Based on his own judgment, right? Based on what he thinks is bad. But our problem is that we don't understand that God is morally perfect. And he not only warns he's going to punish murderers and torturers and rapists, but also thieves and liars and fornicators and blasphemers. Lying is so serious, Scripture says, all liars will have their part in the lake of fire. Twenty times in the New Testament alone, the New Testament says that hell is identified by fire. Jesus describes hell as a furnace of fire, weeping and gnashing of teeth as unquenchable fire, eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels, where the worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. Wow, do I think me personally and my sin deserve eternal conscious torment? Um, I would like to say no. <laughs> um, nope. I don't think that the crime and the punishment are balanced. <laughs> You know, I see God as a very loving individual. And why would he torment somebody forever who only had a life of 60 or 70 or 80 years? <laughs> Sinners punished in hell continue to sin. It's not as if, you know, sinners in hell have then come to their senses and have turned and saying, oh God, please now, would you forgive me? And I love Christ and I worship him. No, no, the, the, the description, and the way the Bible understands it is that there's a continuing sense of rebellion and thumbing your nose against God and a further hardening of their heart. We're not understanding that our greatest problem that needs to be addressed isn't just a, a sin problem of the things that we have done, but it's rather the person whom we have done those sins against. The thing is that God is just a lot holier than many of us think. And if God really is holier, then that means sin is worse than many of us actually think. I think the way that the, the Bible tries to explain that is, uh, you know, any sin against an infinite God carries infinite consequences. If I pick up a rock and I scratch a rock, I'm guilty of scratching the rock, but I'm not going to face any consequences. If I go to a, a dump site and I see a trashed car there and I take my key out and I scratch the car, People are going to say, hey, what are you doing? If I go to a used car lot and I scratch a car, right, now I'm, now I'm a criminal offender, right? But if I go on a Ferrari lot, I take the same key out and I scratch the car, right? My, my punishment just got way bigger, right? It just intensified. Why? Because of the value of the thing I sinned against, the thing I scratched, right? So if God is infinitely valuable, if he is infinitely beautiful and infinitely set apart, and he's holy, right? One little scratch, one little white lie. It's, it's like high treason against the king of all the universe. God's justice demands the death of the sinner. A jealous and avenging God is the Lord. The Lord is avenging and wrathful. The Lord takes vengeance on his adversaries, and he reserves wrath for his enemies. So His Holiness demands that sin be dealt with. So another way to say it is this. Every sin ever committed by every person who has ever lived will be punished. That is required by divine holiness and divine righteousness and divine justice. The idea of justice, like punish the wicked. No, I don't want to punish anybody. I want to redeem everybody. It will either be punished everlastingly in the life of the sinner 
the impenitent, unbelieving sinner, or that punishment will be borne by Christ. John MacArthur might be right about him. That, that's not a guy worthy of my worship. I'm just not interested. But first of all, you need to understand something. God's wrath is not like ours. Our wrath is primarily self-centered. It's, it's um, coercive. It's unrighteous. But God's wrath is pure, and it is the result of His love for that which is right. God's love. How does God even define love? Well, it says in Romans 12 that love must be sincere. Hate what is evil. If you love that which is right, you will hate evil. If you love life, you will hate death. If you love African Americans, you will hate slavery. If you love children, you will hate abortion. If you love Jews, you will hate the Holocaust. Why is it that we reserve the right as fallible human beings to burn with indignation when we see an injustice? And yet we say if God does the same thing, that's somehow morally beneath Him. His love is fierce. And in the same degree, His wrath is fierce against evil. In my own life trying to understand this, I was really encouraged by Revelation 19. Revelation 19 gives us a glimpse of our future, and there we are in the presence of God, and seeing Him judge, they're crying out, hallelujah, to God's judgment, specifically praising Him for judging. What this means is that from this future perspective, now being in the very presence of God, now seeing the justice of God, not just hearing about it, seeing it for themselves, they say, this is good. This judgment you're bringing is, is something I can actually appreciate now. Now perhaps now in your life you're not in a place where you can appreciate God's judgment, but you can choose to trust Him. But we do have in Scripture reason to think that we're going to be at a place in the future where we see it clearly for ourselves and we go, oh, I see how right and good your judgment was all along. To get a better idea of Richard Rohr's view of God, we have to understand his critique of something he calls dualistic thinking. You have to practice rewiring this. The normal way you and I are wired is dualistically. It's a way of thinking about things as either or. So either something is one way or it's another. The dualistic mind is making these distinctions between good and evil, who's in, who's out, who's a Christian, who's not a Christian. For me or against me part of our religion or not. Everything was either or thinking. And he thinks we need to cultivate a non-dual mind. When you get to this level of maturity and enlightenment, then we learn to think in terms of both and. Once you're fighting, you're dualistic. Trust me on that, all right? You've got to choose sides. You've got to prove your opinion. But he's being dualistic, of course, because he's saying that it's better to be non-dual than dualistic. But that's a dualistic statement, because you're making a distinction. As long as you're making distinctions, you're being dualistic. When you get to the contemplative level of life, you don't think dualistically, either or. You almost naturally learn to think both and. Richard Rohr teaches that we need contemplative practices like what is called contemplative prayer. So the goal of, of life is the contemplative mind. The contemplative practices, um, which often involve certain methods where you go into the silence or where you try to experience God rather than think about God, he thinks that these methods will help you have a new consciousness and understanding. So this is why religions at the higher levels try to get us disconnected from this control tower. Kind of like in the Matrix when you take a certain pill and, and you wake up. It's like taking the red pill and everything you've believed about reality before that point is false, but then you'll be open to this new paradigm. Welcome to the real world. Now this method of contemplation, which he may even call meditation, is very different from what the Bible means about meditation. In the case of biblical meditation, you're actively using your mind. You're not setting your thinking mind aside, and you're not trying to have a mystical experience. That's what begins to teach you non-dual thinking. 
in a video clip, he says at this one point, it's where you let the whole moment come towards you as it is. Where you let the whole moment come towards you as it is without dividing the uncomfortable part or separating from the mysterious part. This is really ironic because when it comes to Rohr's understanding of Christian doctrine, when it comes to his understanding of the attributes of God and the atonement, it really seems like that's exactly what he's doing. He's, he's dividing the uncomfortable parts and separating from the mysterious parts. So a dualistic way of looking at the nature of God would be to say, God is either righteous and wrathful, or he's gracious and, and loving. So he actually is dualistic because he's rejecting one attribute of God and accepting the other attribute when the truth is, really, it's both. Of course, the non-dualistic way would be that he displays both his grace and his wrath on the cross together. The moment that we choose a side is the moment that we end up in some theological error. We, we don't want to live in those paradoxes that an incomprehensible being can be both and. You know, we don't like tension in the modern world. We like it to be this or this. We like it to be either or. We grew up with multiple choice. Fill in one bubble. It's not A and B. If you're going to preach a biblical definition of mercy, then you must at some point point to the wrath of God for what are you receiving mercy from and for. I don't love the idea of God's wrath. I don't think it's central to the way the Bible portrays God, particularly not in the New Testament. Clearly Israel had an experience with God's wrath. So it's also not something that I would find ways to, you know, interpret my way out of or around. It's part of Israel's experience, so we need to take it seriously. But it also leads me to believe that God changes. He's denying God's immutability. Part of what makes God God is that he doesn't change. God is not presented in the scriptures as schizophrenic a Dr. Jekyll, Mr. Hyde. You've got as much grace in the Old Testament as you do in the New Testament. He passed over the sins of Moses and Abraham and David. He did not hold them to the degree that the law required. That's grace. Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Jesus talked more about hell than people, I think, want to give him credit for. I think people forget things like Acts chapter 5, Ananias and Sapphira in the New Testament. They were immediately judged. It was to me a sense of like, there's the Old Testament God of wrath and judgment. Right there in the early church, the start of the church, Ananias and Sapphira are struck down dead immediately for their sin. And so what we see is we see that there's two ruts that we want to avoid. We, we certainly don't want to fall into the, the rut on one side of the road that says it's all the wrath of God. We see that in, in certain you know, unbalanced ministries as well. We also see the other rut is that we, all we want to do is talk about the grace of God and the love of God and the mercy of God, but we don't want to talk about the wrath of God. So we need to be balanced. Uh, we have to affirm that both the Old Testament, the New Testament, uh, is both <laughs> an altogether uh, God's breathed out word, uh, fully authoritative. Think of uh, 2 Timothy 3. Paul's referring to Scripture, all Scripture is God breathed. He's primarily referring to the Old Testament. Once you start picking any one part of the Bible and saying, like, I think it's wrong, you go, like, wait a second, this is just a human book. When the reliability of the Bible was being questioned and brought under great scrutiny in this class that I was in, I kind of didn't know where to look. And so I thought, you know, I'm a follower of Jesus. So Jesus is the one who claimed to be God, was resurrected from the dead. He gets to make the rules about what I believe about everything. And so when I was in college, I studied the writings of Karl Barth and I was like, oh my gosh, like, I think this is just a human document. Like, there are all sorts of inconsistencies. There are, you know, like, like I, I mean, when people talk to me about inerrancy. Is the Bible inerrant? <laughs> when someone uses, like, without error or inerrant or infallible to describe the Bible, they're essentially saying they wish they had a different kind of book. For example, uh, Rob Bell has said that it degrades the Bible to put it in the category of inerrant or the Word of God. It actually 
degrades and devalues the Bible because it places categories on the Bible that nobody in the Bible would ever have thought to even place on the Bible. But to say that the Bible is inerrant when it doesn't even refer to itself as inerrant is really, really problematic. To say that it's authoritative, I would say, what do you mean by that? Just looking at what Jesus believed about the Old Testament is stunning. It's very clear that Jesus affirmed over and over and over again that the Old Testament was the Word of God. Uh, Jesus is the Word of God incarnate, and yet he submitted to the Scriptures. Three times the devil comes and tempts him, and Jesus says each time, it is written, it is written, it is written. The devil even quotes scripture back to him. So in Matthew 15, 4, he referenced several commands from Exodus and Leviticus and Deuteronomy. And how he described them was he said, for God said, and then he quotes the Old Testament passage. He told the Pharisees that they void the word of God by adding their own traditions to it. So he's referring to scripture as the word of God there. And so when he says in his high priestly prayer in John 17, 17, sanctify them in truth, your word is truth, it meant that it's revelation. And it's reliable revelation because it comes from God. Scripture has come to us over time. That's what we mean by progressive, over time. But it's not as if the earlier revelation is regressive uh, or inferior and somehow the New Testament is better in the sense that it's correcting the mistakes of the old. But progressive Christianity as a movement looks at the earliest Christians. They look at Paul and Peter, the first disciples, the first century church, the second century church. And they view that as that's Christianity in its infancy. Essentially you read the Bible as an evolving narrative. So the knowledge they had of God at that time wasn't quite as evolved as the knowledge that we have now. Instead of, well, God did this, we don't know. All we have is human accounts of what, how people understood it in their evolving understandings of how the world works. All throughout history, uh, human beings are growing and maturing and evolving into what Brian McLaren would call a higher and wiser view of God. Uh, so the Bible becomes sort of like an interesting book to see what people thought of God at the time. But it's not actually God-breathed words. In the evolution of human consciousness, we were infantile and we pulled God down to our level, you know? A fighting God, an angry God, a jealous God. Yeah. So Oprah, apparently, according to her, was first alienated from Christianity hearing a sermon about God as a jealous God. I, I think I shared this with you before. I was sitting in a church service listening to a really fine minister talk about God being angry and jealous and in the same breath saying omnipotent, all caring, all loving. For you shall not worship any other God. For the Lord whose name is jealous is a jealous God. And I was, you know, caught up in the rapture of that moment until he said jealous. And she took the word jealous in the wrong way, not understanding what that means, that God is zealous for who he is and won't share his glory. She took it as meaning jealous of her. And God's also jealous? Jealous? God is jealous of me? A jealous God? Like, but God is love. How is that possible? Um, I don't think I have so much of a problem with Oprah maybe recoiling in that moment. Something about that didn't, didn't feel right in my spirit. But what I have a problem with is that instead of testing the spirits, instead of going through the scriptures to understand for herself, she just totally tossed out any concept of what the pastor was saying and decided to just go with her feelings. That's when the, the, the search for something more than doctrine uh, started to stir within me. I would love to talk to that person because that person is very intelligent, very hardworking. They've, they've created an empire. Now, this is what I would say to them. If I walked into your central offices where you have your main office as founder and president of your empire, and I walked right in and said, I'm taking over and I started commanding people to do certain things, I started taking money, I started spending it a certain way. Although I have nothing to do with what you built, 
You would probably walk out of your office with disdain, and rightfully so, and say to me, who do you think you are? This is not yours. And I say, well, whose is it? Well, it's mine. I made it. And you would, you would be rightfully jealous for the thing that you had created, that you had made. Would you reserve the right for you to feel that way? For you to burn with a righteous jealousy over the things that you created, and yet you say that God has no right to be jealous over the things that He has made. He has every right. This is His world. But His jealousy goes beyond ours and that ours is oftentimes selfish and self-centered. His jealousy also benefits His creatures because He knows that for us to live for anything other than Him will just lead to us being ruined. And so His jealousy actually is motivated not only by His glory, but by His love. Wow, what do you think? Uh, the Lord God said, let there be light as there was light. What what comes up that speaks to you uh, from what we just saw? What what overarching thought do you get when you watch this? Uh, scary what's going on with Christianity in the world. Okay. Yeah, the, the wise that are out there by the end. Uh, and I, something that I've noticed, first of all, uh, big, big lie out there now, and then it's being shared in churches about hell, that there's no hell. And and some of the, some of the Christian speakers that, you know, have a problem with hell, in a good way, meaning it's hard to imagine. And as we sit here, and I see this all the time now, there are billions of people in hell suffering. That's a tough thing for me to think about. There, it just is. Um, uh, is that the right, did God do the wrong? God says what's right and wrong. This is God's punishment. This is the punishment for sin. Um, Jesus, if we trust in Christ, we don't have to go to hell because Jesus pays the atonement for our sin. But it's trusting in Christ that gives us that atonement. And if we choose to not trust in Christ, then the that the wages of sin is death. Um, so. Do any of you have do any of you struggle with hell? I mean, what do you think? Does somebody say, you know, that's right. People who sin should go to hell for eternity. The only thing that I struggle with hell is um, certainly I don't want to go there, but I struggle with I know people who are good people. Um, I've had family members who I think are good people but didn't know Jesus. And even though I'm told that when I get to heaven, if I get to heaven, that it's going to be okay that they're not there, I find that hard to... To right. understand that I'm going to be okay with that. Yeah. Especially people that you've known. The Bible yes. tells us that he will wipe away all tears. <clears throat> um, some pastors say that we'll have no remembrance of those people. Uh, so that because it, to realize that part of your loved ones is in hell would not be something pleasant you want to think about for the next one and a half million years. You know? Yeah, add into an item because heaven is eternal. Um, did we notice uh, the big push or the big people that are really buying into the lie? And this, this struck me when I saw them in the film. Post evangelical uh, children who were raised in the church and are basically rebelling about against what they were brought up in uh, are the, the biggest, the Richard Rohr, the uh, 
uh, universalism uh, is they're the big recipients of the big believers in this universalism that you know, everybody's going to go to heaven and everybody's going to be okay. And I, I wonder how much of that is on us, the church, for not doing a better job when the kids are in youth group or Sunday school or when we have the opportunity to tell them and present them with Bible doctrine in a way they can understand. Um, how much of that is our fault for not doing a better job of instilling in them the Bible doctrine that we had growing up? Because I'm assuming everyone here went to Sunday school in some way. Or you go to Sunday school? Um, no, my family's not believers. Okay. So you, you came to Christ later in life. Mm hmm. Okay. How about it? Bill, did you go to Sunday school? Every Sunday. And I, Debbie, I know you and I did. And I'm sure Mike did too. Mike's, you know, religious. Um, that basis that we had really helped me. I mean, do I know more today, glory to God, than I did when I was 12? Yes. But I happen to have that foundation. Lori, you had a genuine experience, and, and God grabbed a hold of you, if you will, and rescued you uh, through Christ. You, so you, but you've had a good, I, I can say at Knox Church, we've had a good foundation of biblical teaching here, both in small groups and for the pulpit. Thank God. You know, um, the churches today, I, I say go to drive down Elwood Avenue or Delaware Avenue and you're going to get the majority of the church, not all, but the majority of the churches are not going to be Bible. They're going to be the universal feel-good gospel. You know? uh, or if you turn on television too much. Uh, I was just watching something yesterday. Now this idea of universalism goes back to Bob Schuller, you know, which is a long time ago. Bob Schuller Cathedral of White, you know. Uh, and his father, for me, J. Vernon Lee talks about Schuller's dad. And Schuller's dad was a, a man of faith. Um, the son, not so much. So, in this post event, uh, I know we've got to quit. It's after seven. What my idea is let's agree to talk about this some more next week before we watch the next thing. Is that okay? We agree with that? Yep. Okay. Yep, sounds good. Okay, all right. Let's let's call it a day at 703. Thank you all for coming this morning. Um, who wants to lead us with prayer to end our time together this morning? Dear Heavenly Father, um, we know that we live in your world. We're thankful that you um, put us here um, in a church that is speaking the truth of the Bible. I pray, Lord, that everything, everyone that comes to this place will understand that it's about you, Jesus. And we have to follow you. Keep us all safe as we go to our daily lives today. And um, help us to know you that. In Christ's name. Amen. Thank you, God.